Hello. Uh, today we will begin a new uh, chapter, uh, which is uh, medium access control uh, protocols for wireless sensor uh, networks. Uh, the medium access control protocol should uh, fulfill at least two uh, essential uh, purposes. The first one is to mediate uh, or arbitrate the uh, shared uh, medium. And the second is uh, power management. The radio uh, subsystem uh, is next only to the uh, processor subsystem in terms of uh, power consumption, there, even when it's idle. Therefore, the radio has to be turned off uh, whenever the node is idle and it has to be turned on on time uh, for uh, packet transmission and uh, reception. When uh, security is a critical aspect of the wireless sensor network, uh, then uh, the security model should be implemented in the uh, MAC uh, protocol because after a packet is successfully uh, received, uh, the MAC uh, layer should make sure that uh, this packet is received from a legitimate or authorized uh, node before the packet is forwarded to the um, higher level uh, protocol, such as the routing protocol, or even to the application itself. But the focus of this uh, lecture today is on uh, the communication aspect of the uh, MAC layer protocols. There are different types of MAC uh, protocols. The scope and uh, usefulness of these protocols can be objectively evaluated by defining uh, certain quantitative uh, metrics. Uh, I have listed a few of them here and uh, would like to uh, briefly discuss. The first uh, metric is the energy efficiency of the uh, protocol. Uh, packet transmission, as I said, costs energy. And since the uh, medium access control protocol is responsible for initiating and completing uh, communication, the uh, time needed to complete this transaction uh, has direct bearing on the uh, uh, energy consumption per packet. So the mark layer protocol can be evaluated in terms of the uh, energy consumption per packet. The second aspect is latency. Latency is the time needed to successfully uh, complete a transaction. In uh, general purpose networks, we have two types of latency. The first one is the end-to-end -end latency. This is mainly the uh, concern of the uh, routing protocol. That means if two uh, nodes communicate uh, indirectly, then the time needed to uh, transfer a packet from the source to the destination is called the end-to-end -end, uh, latency. Uh, for the MAC protocol, however, the point-to-point -point latency is of importance here. Uh, so that it has to be evaluated in terms of this point-to-point -point, uh, latency. Another aspect is scalability. We have uh, listed here three different types of uh, scalability aspects. The first one is in general, when the size of the network changes, how does the MAC protocol cope with this change? The size could be increasing or the size could be decreasing uh, in, in, in both uh, aspects the protocol should be adaptive. The second aspect of scalability is uh, local. That means when the nodes, uh, a node's degree changes, 
That means when the, the neighbor, the number of neighbors of a given node changes, how does the MAC protocol cope or adapt to this uh, change? Since we are dealing here with local dynamics, we are specifically talking about the density of the network. Uh, related to this uh, aspect is the change in the topology of the network. When nodes come and go, or for some uh, reason, the uh, aspect of the environment itself changes, in which case the topology has to change. When the topology changes, of course, the performance of the MAC protocol, as well as the um, prerequisite and assumptions of the protocol change. Uh, does the MAC protocol uh, accept this type of change in, in the topology and adapts itself to uh, this change? The other parameter is channel utilization. Channel utilization simply means the uh, number of useful packets or the portion of uh, useful packets transmitted in a given time. If we monitor the wireless channel long enough, uh, different types of packets would be uh, transferred uh, through this uh, channel. Some of these packets are required to, uh, for management purpose to avoid collision, for example. If a large portion of the, the channels, uh, sorry, if a large portion of the packets are control packets or management packets, then we see that the overhead is significantly bigger than the uh, useful packets and the channel utilization is poor. Uh, if on the other hand, the MAC protocol utilizes as little amount of uh, control packets as possible to mediate or to arbitrate the medium, then its channel utilization is good. The next parameter is throughput. Throughput simply considers all the packets uh, or the rate of uh, transmission of packets uh, here without discriminating uh, the different types of uh, packets. Uh, throughput is more of the aspect of the uh, stability of the wireless link uh, than the quality of the MAC uh, protocol. <laughs> Finally, the uh, parameter we consider is fairness. In general purpose uh, computer, uh, computer networks, fairness is critical. We assume that the nodes are independent and each node should have a fair share of the medium. Uh, no pair of uh, communicating nodes should uh, unfairly or predominantly occupy the medium. So one of the essential aspects in general purpose computer network of the MAC protocol is making sure that all nodes utilize the medium fairly. In wireless sensor networks, however, the whole network belongs to a given application. And the need of this application dictates which node should communicate, when they should communicate, for how long they should communicate. If, for example, it's a case of emergency, then we give exclusive use of the medium to particular nodes which have, for example, since it's an interesting uh, event. So fairness is uh, important, but in sensor networks, it is not a priority. But when all nodes should be uh, sensing uh, equitably, then of course the MAC layer protocol should take this aspect also into account. Of all these parameters, energy efficiency is important because 
in wireless sensor networks, the nodes operate with exhaustible batteries. Uh, charging or replacing these batteries is usually not an option, uh, uh, partly because of the uh, scale of the, the networks. And uh, if we were going to collect the whole sensor nodes, bring them to the lab and uh, recharge or replace batteries, then uh, during this time, sensing is not uh, taking place. Uh, and also the whole process is quite tedious. That means energy has to be utilized efficiently. As far as the radio, the wireless radio uh, chip is concerned, uh, energy can be wasted in three uh, different uh, ways. When there is no uh, communication or when there is no need uh, for communication. Uh, the first one is uh, idle listening. That means that the radio, even when it is not communicating, all its components are, however, act active. All the transistors are biased. That means current is flowing through them and energy is being uh, consumed. Idle listening consumes a significant amount of uh, energy. Uh, especially for low, uh, for, for short range uh, communication, the uh, idle listening is comparable to the, uh, the, the, the cost of transmission as well as uh, reception. So this has to be taken into, uh, into account. Uh, another aspect is overhearing. Overhearing means the channel is busy, uh, two uh, uh, partners are communic communicating with uh, one another. If a third node uh, has simply turned on the radio, then of course the antenna begins intercepting this um, uh, packet. The, the front end has to uh, amplify the, the, the signal. All the detection process has to take place before the node determines that this packet is not for it. That means first the packet has to be received, uh, pass to the uh, MAC protocol. The MAC protocol evaluates the destination and um, uh, recipient address to determine, oh, this is not for me. That means the whole process is energy uh, consuming. Uh, now, these are when there, there is absolutely no communication taking place. When communication taking place, uh, the first cost of energy is collision. The poorer the MAC protocol, the uh, more frequent collision on useful packets takes place. And this is quite unfortunate and energy uh, consuming because the packet has to be uh, retransmitted. In order to avoid a collision, of course, some MAC uh, protocols uh, define handshaking. That means first the, the, the nodes should agree how and when they should uh, communicate. For this, they have to exchange uh, control packets and only afterwards uh, the proper communication takes place. But the exchange of control packets costs also energy. And uh, this uh, cost should also be uh, minimized. There are different types of medium access control protocols. Medium access control protocols, remember, make sure that when multiple, two or more communicating devices share a wireless medium, there should be a mechanism that they can freely communicate without causing interference on each other. In uh, cellular communication, we uh, take advantage of code division, multiple, uh, multiple access, frequency division, multiple access, uh, space division, multiple access. Uh, but for wireless sensor networks, this type of multiple access protocols are not admissible because either their um, energy consumption is significantly high or they require complex transmission and uh, uh, receiving uh, devices. 
That means that the design of the transmitter as well as the receiver is uh, quite complex that the cost is not affordable. The two most frequently used medium access control protocols uh, for wireless sensor networks are time division multiple access and carrier sense multiple uh, access. This lecture will focus only on these two, uh, paying particular attention to the second one, which is CSMA carrier sense multiple access. A time division multiple access, we have treated this uh, protocol or this approach when we discussed about uh, schedulers, uh, round robin uh, schedulers in operating systems. Uh, for the sake of completeness, I will briefly discuss TDMA here. In TDMA, the uh, nodes access a medium only for a particular amount of time. When this time is over, then they have to refrain from uh, communicating. Time, as you see here, is sliced into multiple slots, and each slot will be given to a particular node. They can listen at any given time. All the nodes can send data to uh, uh, a node at any given time, but nodes cannot transmit outside of their slot. And if we have N neighbors, then we need N slots. That means a frame has N slot. Then when a node, for example, node one is assigned the slot one, node one can only transmit packets uh, during slot one then it has to wait until all the others have utilized their slots and then it can resume communication. Uh, time division multiple access requires a centralized node which allocates the slots to the communicating uh, partners which determines also the size of a slot and the size of a frame. So this type of uh, protocol is for centralized topology or for centralized uh, network. There are different types of uh, optimization strategies to determine uh, the size of a node, to determine the size of, sorry, to determine the size of a slot and to determine the number of slot constituting a frame. The advantage of time division multiple access is it is straightforward, it's collision free because no node should transmit outside of its slot. So there is absolutely no, uh, no collision. Uh, the time is shared fairly. So fairness is uh, achieved. Uh, of course, one can assign multiple slots to certain priority uh, nodes depending on the requirements of the uh, application. The uh, another uh, advantage is uh, it's relatively easy to define sleeping time. So for example, all node two to n can determine when they should sleep when node one is uh, communicating or if node one finished communicating and uh, it is um, aware of the size of a frame, then after completing its slot, it can sleep for n minus one slots to save uh, energy and in case it is not expecting any packets from its neighbor. So sleep management is relatively easier the communication uh, procedure is defined uh, straightforward. Uh, there is absolutely no uh, collision. These are some of the advantages of a time division uh, multiple access protocol. But it has several limitations. Uh, the first uh, limitation 
as I said, uh, it's a centralized approach. Uh, it's not distributed, but most wireless sensor networks are rather uh, distributed, especially if we are deploying them for short term uh, purpose. Uh, in this case, time deviation multiplexes does not help us much. The second uh, aspect is in wireless sensor network, the nodes are simple nodes. They can be defected, they can be stolen. Uh, for some reason, they may also um, uh, finish their uh, energy reserve and uh, become inactive. That means if these nodes are no longer available, then the slot allocated to them may not be used unless the whole uh, uh, allocation of slots is uh, redefined by the cluster head or by the base station or by the central by the central node allocating slots if on the other hand new nodes join in then the whole uh, frame has to be uh, redefined so this type of uh, difficulty to adapt the, the frame to the current state of the network makes the use of TDMA uh, problematic. Another important aspect is it needs time synchronization. That means nodes should agree about time. And since we are dealing here with cheaper sensor nodes, their clock drifts quite easily. That means every now and then there has to be adjustment of time so that nodes agree when a slot begins and when it ends. Otherwise, there is no make, it does not make sense to talk about collision-free communication if there is no uh, concept of mutual uh, time. For this reason, most existing protocols uh, MAC protocols for wireless sensor networks are based on CSMA, and I'm going to explain this in more detail uh, in the subsequent sections. CSMA is a simple communication algorithm or paradigm which has literally revolutionized computer networks. It was first uh, implemented in Hawaii, uh, you remember the Aloha, uh, the Aloha um, algorithm. It is based on common human decency. That means if you want to talk in the presence of many people who wish also to talk, you need to first listen and make sure that no one is speaking. If the medium is not occupied, if nobody is talking, then you can talk. But the decision is on you. Nobody will tell you when to talk and when to refrain from talking. It is a distributed algorithm based on this concept. Listen before talking. Listen to the, the, the channel. How do you determine if the channel is free or not? Remember the antenna, it always intercepts this electromagnetic signal. And if the magnitude of this signal is above a certain threshold for a certain period of time, then you can make sure that it is occupied. If the magnitude of the signal intercepted by the uh, antenna is below this threshold and be for a certain period of time to make sure that your sensing is consistent, then you can assume the medium is free. This is a, a simple algorithm. SESMA can be persistent or non-persistent. This simply means if it's a persistent uh, protocol, then a node listens persistently until the medium is free 
and then it immediately grabs the medium to transmit a packet. These are highly, highly critical or time critical applications. If a packet has to be transmitted as quickly as possible, then the node persistently listens to the medium until it's free. But the energy consumption is now high because listening, as I told you, costs. Listening simply means, look, intercepting an electromagnetic field, amplifying this electromagnetic field, processing to see if the medium is free or not. This costs energy. But if energy is of less priority for the application, rather than latency, then in this case, the protocol is called uh, persistent. But if it's non-persistent, then the, 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 the node is not in a hurry to transmit a packet. That means it, it tries, it listens. If the medium is uh, occupied, it postpones the transmission for some arbitrary time. And then at a random time in the future, it listens to the medium once again. So in this case, we are talking about non-persistent MAC protocols. Here, uh, energy efficiency is more important than latency. A trade-off can be achieved by implementing P-persistence. P-persistence means a node persists to listen to the medium with a probability of P, and with a probability of one minus P, it goes to sleep. So here, depending on the, 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 the balance we wish to achieve between energy efficiency and latency, we can determine P. If latency is more important, then P could be greater than 0 0.5. If on the other hand, energy is more important, then P can be below 0 0.5. How does it work? Imagine we have here four sensor nodes. Since we wish to have a fully connected network, that means a packet originating from any of this sensor node can reach any of the other sensor nodes using uh, potentially multi-hop communication. Then we want to make sure that they are within their transmission range. Okay, so ideally, for example, this is how we should place the sensor nodes. Here, you see, this is a transmission range of A, this is a transmission range of B, C, and D. Since we are talking here uh, about uh, the same type of sensor nodes with the same type of hardware and software uh, configuration, we should assume that their transmission range is the same, their power consumption is also the same. So if we have this type of arrangement, then we wish the nodes to communicate with one another without interfering one another. Interfering one another means packet collision. If there is a packet collision, nobody benefits from this, then the packet has to be retransmitted. And remember, we want to achieve uh, the arbitration in as far as the use of the medium is concerned without any centralized node. All nodes are here equal. No one is going to assume the responsibility of a centralized node. So what we happen is, what happened is if nodes simply listen, before they communicate, then we will have one problem. And that is the following. A, as you can see, A's transmission range is here. So when A communicates, only B can listen to it. C, however, cannot listen to it. So B, when, when A communicates with B, if A is transferring packet to B, and B is simply receiving, 
then C will not know that A is communicating with B. So assuming that, okay, the, the, the medium is free, if C also begins to communicate, but C, uh, C can uh, reach B, A can reach B, then collision can happen at B. Similarly, D will never be able to listen to A, so D can communicate with C. If C sends acknowledgement, C's communication range is this whole circle because the electromagnetic field goes in 360 degrees in every direction. That means when C sends acknowledgement to D, this acknowledgement may reach B. And C's acknowledgement packet and S useful packet may collide at B and B may not receive S packet successfully. So that means just listening to the medium may not be sufficient to avoid collision. Listening to the medium may avoid collision here between A and B, because if B is communicating, A shouldn't communicate. A can listen whether B is communicating or not but A cannot listen to the communication of C, A cannot listen to the communication of D, and vice versa. So how can we make sure that A and C can indirectly know what's going on in their environment? Likewise, how can D know what's going on in its environment? This can be achieved by the use of a handshake. So before actual communication takes place, A can send a request to send. If the medium is free, B can say, okay, send. Because B knows that whether C is active or not. So B can determine whether the medium is free. And e, when B sends a clear message, this message will be received not only by A, but also by C. So C can say, oh, the medium is now going to be taken. I have to refrain from communication. This type of handshake can increase the listening range of A by way of B. And the, the packets we need for this purpose are called control packets. They are essentially very slim packets so that they don't need to uh, consume uh, energy during transmission. And if pack packet collision occurs on, on them, it's okay, it's affordable. Compared to the size of a data packet, the size of a control packet is significantly small. So instead of occur the, the, the collision occurring on the data packet, now it's occurring on the control packet, which, is, which can be affordable. Okay, I will illustrate the, the whole process as follows. So here we have two uh, transmitters, sender one and sender two. They both wish to communicate with R but the transmission range of S is this long. So it cannot determine whether this media, uh, C, uh, uh, S1 is busy or not. So by the use of control packets, so S first listen, listens for the medium for a certain amount of time to determine that its immediate vicinity is free. Then if it's free, it sends request to send to R. R has a better knowledge about the environment because it listens on both sides. If the medium on both sides is free, then it can send clear to send. But now this clear to send message goes in both directions. So indirectly S2 will know that, oh, if R sends clear to send, that means it's meaning to communicate with, with someone. 
so I must refrain to see the medium. Then, if this clear to send arrives, data communication can take place. Remember, the data packet is much larger than the, the control packet. So the cost of using control packet is affordable. When the communication ends, then R sends acknowledgement. And this acknowledgement travels in both direction in the same way the uh, clear to send traveled in both direction. This is a signal for S2 that the communication between S1 and R, R is coming to completion. Then it can now contend to seize the medium. So this is a simple, straightforward, but distributed algorithm based on which Wi-Fi functions, Bluetooth functions, and also the wireless sensor network function. Specifically, how does this take place, technically speaking? Remember, a wireless sensor node is at once a transmitter and a receiver. It has but one antenna. So that means for transmission, it has to use this, and for receiving, it has to use the same antenna. But all the uh, other components are different. The component we use for transmission and the component we use for uh, receiving are different. But here, as you can see, when S1 sends RTS, it is on the transmission mode. When S1 receives CTS, it is on receiving mode. So that means there is a time needed for switching between receiving and transmitting. This time, the, the radio requires to switch itself from receiving to transmitting and vice versa is called short interframe space. This short interframe space is required to do the adjustment. Okay, with this knowledge, this is how communication happens. For some time in the beginning, a node has to listen if the medium is free. This is depicted by CCA. That means clear channel assessment. Clear channel assessment simply means the, a node receives or listens to the, uh, its surrounding, measures if the signal level is above a, a certain threshold or below a certain threshold for some time. If it's below a certain uh, threshold for some time, that means the medium is free. But it shouldn't jump to communicate immediately because another node may also be listening at the same time. So to avoid a potential of collision after CCA, both should randomly back off. So this random back off, RBO, signifies random back off. That means, suppose I and you wish to communicate. I will pick one number from zero to 10, just randomly, let's say six. You two pick one, for example, you pick three. We both now count down. You will count down more quickly than I because you have picked three. That means you will have the medium first. If I listen again, I will determine that it is occupied already. So I have to wait for the next round. So a random back off ensures that collision does not occur on nodes which obtain CCA at the same time. Then after that, now it was, remember, during CCA, it was listening. Now it has to switch the radio to transmitting. This short interframe space is needed for that one. After this short interframe space, it sends now request to send. After request to send, it has to listen for the arrival of a clear to send message. That means it has to switch its radio back to listening mode. And the time needed for that is this SIFS. And then if 
CTS arrives, okay, the channel is free, then it has to switch the, the, the radio back to transmitting mode, after which it transmits the data. In order to know whether the data or the packet has arrived successfully, it has to switch back to listening mode to receive acknowledgement. And then with the arrival of the acknowledgement, the transaction is closed. And nodes now can begin comp uh, competing for the medium all over again. With the potential now, if I and you were going to communicate, I will have the success because after your successful uh, transmission, you have to pick a number greater than three now. And with a probability of, let's say, 90% uh, you would pick eight or nine. In which case I will have the possibility to win the medium again. So you can see that this is quite straightforward, but quite distributed. You, we don't need any additional uh, arbitrator to help us who should win the medium and when. So the question of who should win the medium and for how long they should see the medium is encoded in the CSMA CA. CA stands for collision avoidance. Okay, more pictorially, this is what happens. Here we have two, two different types of colors. The green one, uh, uh, signifies transmission and the light green one trans, uh, uh, signifies receiving. So if here we, we have two sensor nodes wishing to communicate to each other, let's say S1 has first uh, censored a free medium, then S1 sends RTS, it takes some time to reach the, the receiver. The receiver is in the receiving mode here. If the medium is free, it will switch back to transmission and then sends clear to send. So when it sends clear to send to S1, of course S2 will also listen to that. And then S2 indirectly know that S1 and R are going to communicate. And it can approximate how long this communication would take and during this time it can switch off the radio and sleep to save energy and it can wake up at the right time to receive the acknowledgement packet and to know that communication is now over and it can compete to seize the medium so as you can see this simple distributed algorithm can also be used to manage power because now the medium access control knows how long it would take from the uh, receiving of the CTS to the completion of the data transmission because the size of a packet in wireless sensor network is fixed. About 28 bytes. So because it is fixed, the node can calculate for how long it should sleep. What will happen if two sensor nodes sense a free medium at the same time. If they both sense a CCA and perchance pick up the same time, uh, uh, back of time, they would send a request to send at the same time and there will be a collision. So the uh, receiver would send no clear to send message. So again, they both have to uh, sense the, uh, a free medium. That means CCA will be conducted, random backup will be conducted. And this time, the probability of them choosing the same back of time will be different. So one of them would seize the medium first. In this case, for example, RTS. So this one now would pick up the clear to sense, uh, clear to send because it has, uh, assuming it has picked a longer uh, random back off, would immediately know, okay, someone is communicating. Now I can refrain from communication and then sleep to save the medium. And between the S1 and R, the whole procedure commences to successfully transfer a packet. 
The problem with uh, C SMHCA is that uh, collision may not be avoided entirely. We have here to deal with exposed terminal problem. I am going to show you in two different ways how this exposed terminal uh, affects uh, communication. Exposed terminal is a problem of the uh, extreme send, uh, extreme nodes which may not be able to send the uh, the uh, a free which may think that they are sensing a free medium even if the medium on the other side is not free two different cases of exposed terminal problem so in the beginning i told you we have a b c d arranged in this in this way it's a fully connected uh, network so here for example if a wishes to communicate with b and d wish to communicate with c so the two extreme cases here a wishes to communicate with b d wishes to communicate with c so both would sense a free medium. They would think that the medium is free. In case the medium is free, because it's only A and D wishing to communicate. B and C do not wish to communicate. They are recipients. So A sends RT C, because now C is just a passive uh, node. It just wishes to receive a packet. The medium seems to be free. And C, and B is also a, a, a passive node. It's just a, a receiver. Uh, if D wishes to communicate with C, C would assume the communication is free. So in both cases, B and C would send clear to send because they think that the communication is free because they, they are not sensing anything. So A sends RTS, receives CTS. D sends uh, re uh, request to send because at this time the medium is free. Of course, there, there, there will be collision uh, between the RTS from D and the CTS from B. Here there will be a collision. But remember, this collision that doesn't matter because when B sends clear to send, a has already received clear to send, even if the, the packet collision has occurred here. And because R, uh, D has not received RTS, it, it assumes that there is collision, someone is competing with it. And then after a while, it will send a request to send again. Now C being a passive at this time assumes that, okay, nothing is taking place. It would send clear to send. A has already received clear to send from B. Then it will begin streaming packets or streaming uh, bits. So there will be a collision between the, the data packet here and the clear to send coming from C. Just because of a misunderstanding of the, the, the node in between, B and C. The node in between, remember, they are receivers they, they don't wish to communicate they just want to receive packet but the one uh, at the extreme they wish to communicate with with them in which case packet collision happens on the clear to send and the data packet another uh, problem is again here a wishes to communicate and c wishes to communicate but b and d are receivers Again, remember B does not want to communicate and D does not want to communicate. As far as B is concerned, and the, the, the node may sense a free uh, medium and D may also sense a, a free medium and could send clear to send. So what happens is the following. A sends a request to send. At this point, nobody is uh, communicating. So B has no reason to refrain, but B would send a clear to send. But at this point, remember when B is sending clear to send, C is now requesting to communicate with D. So there will be collision. This is okay. 
but the create to send request has already arrived at D. D could not sense this collision. It's far away from it. It will send clear to send. Collision happens on uh, CTS emanating from B, but A does not know that collision has happened because it's far away from it. So it begins transmitting data. Since D has already sent a clear to send here, A begins sending data. And this data would also try, um, propagate on, on the other direction. So there will be collision here. At least in this case, D will receive the, the, the data because collision happens on B and D sends acknowledgement to C. So these type of problems are unavoidable. The, the exposed terminal problems are unavoidable. But still we manage communicating. That means Wi-Fi works, wireless sensor network works, Bluetooth works, why? The reason is that we are dealing here with a probabilistic problem, okay? The probability that this, con this configuration and this configuration, that the node wish to communicate at this time and at this time is very low. It may happen when we are communicating a, vo a large volume of data, but if this happens, we simply retransmit packets and we tolerate this type of packet collision. So CSMACA minimizes collision. It does not completely eliminate collision. By contrast, TDMA, remember, avoids collision completely, assuming that there is a strict time synchronization. But the cost of time synchronization is higher than the cost of retransmitting packets here. So even if collisions occur with CSMA, either they are occurring on control packets, the size of which is relatively small, or even if packet collision happens on data packets, still the probability is low and we can afford to retransmit. Because now the freedom of implementing distributed a distributed protocol here is much more important. Nodes here decide by themselves, the medium is shared fairly and the probability of collision occurring is relatively low. Now coming to power management, as I said, for wireless sensor networks, the nodes of which operate with exhaustible batteries, it is important that the radio should be turned off when it is idle. Almost all existing MAC protocols for sensor network implement some form of duty cycling based on the assumption that interesting events in sensor networks occur only occasionally. If we are monitoring leaks in pipelines, we hope that these leaks happen only occasionally. If we are monitoring toxic gases in industrial complex, we hope that this happens occasionally. If we are monitoring temperature, humidity, uh, barometric pressure, we hope that the change in these quantities is slow. That means it is possible to occasionally switch off radio and save energy. This can be done by defining a duty cycle. That means nodes sleep much of the time and turn on their radio only occasionally. And the MAC protocol will be responsible to implement this duty cycle so that it can switch off and switch on the radio on time. So what happens is the following. In most existing 
uh, sensor network, the radio is turned on probably one to 10% of the time. One to 10%. That means most of the time it's switched off. So here we define active times. The green ones you see here are active time and the one in between are sleep time. So the time, the, the, the period of the, of the duty cycle T, capital T, is defined as TA, active time plus TS. And the duty cycle is the portion of time during this time the radio is turned on. And this is TA over T times 100%. And as I told you, this amounts to one to 10% of the time. That means the MAC protocol should define or uh, rather implement this duty cycle to turn on and off the radio. I'm going to show you three different approaches how this uh, duty cycle can be defined. The, the problem is uh, implementing a duty cycle is not a problem. If we have large scale sensor nodes, and if nodes are free to switch off their radio whenever they wish, how can they agree when to communicate? For example, if node A is sleeping, but if node B wishes to communicate with it, how, how does it know that its neighbor is sleeping? One option will be whenever node A goes to sleep, it has to notify its uh, neighbors and the, the neighbors should have a table, a sleeping table, and this requires memory. We don't want this. So there has to be a distribution, a, a distributed mechanism to enable nodes communicate with one another despite their decision to sleep independently. Most of the popular MAC protocols enable nodes to go to sleep anytime they wish based on their local statistics about the activity of the, the network, but they should agree on the duty cycle. So the duty cycle is a global parameter. If they have to sleep, for example, 90% of the time, they have to sleep 90% of the time, and they have to agree what it means to, have to sleep 90% of the time, which time. So they must agree about TA, about TS, and about capital T. If they, they sleep, then they should sleep only for TS time. And then they have to be active for TA time. This is a global parameter. Otherwise, nodes are free to sleep. So this is how nodes, remember, when we define a duty cycle, that means we accept a minimum amount of latency for nodes to communicate with one another. A maximum amount of TS may elapse for a node to wake up and communicate with its neighbor. So this latency is foreseen when a duty cycle is defined. And usually it is based on the, uh, the latency requirement of the application that we define the duty cycle. Okay. So if two nodes should communicate with one another, but at the same time implement duty cycles, this has to be done asynchronously because synchronous sleeping is unaffordable. It's quite costly. Node cannot sleep at the same time and wake up at the same time because the, the, the activity of the network is different from one end to another. And it is impossible to, uh, uniformly lets nodes to sleep and wake up at the same time. You cannot even do it in a pattern. Again, to keep and maintain this pattern will be, uh, would be costly. But as I said, nodes should agree about duty cycle. This is a global parameter that, and it simplifies uh, the implementation of a sleeping schedule. 
But again, they are free to determine when they should sleep and when they should wake up, depending on the, the local activity, as I say. Now, if node A wishes to communicate with node B, how does it determine that node B is ready for communication? Because node B is free to go to sleep. In this case, one type of uh, protocols are called preamble based protocols. Preamble based protocol means when a node is ready to send a packet, it simply sends a preamble. A preamble is just a repetition of zero and ones, which are quite robust to noise, but they have no meaning in themselves. So we just bombarded the, 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 the neighbor nodes with preamble for some time. This is an expression of interest for communication. So a node receiving a preamble knows that, okay, someone in the neighborhood wishes to communicate with him. Then it will send acknowledgement. Okay, I'm awake. How long should this preamble take place? Because a node sleeps at least for TS and then it wakes up. That means the preamble should last at, at least for TS. Because it would be certain that a node wakes up after TS. So for the, the first generation of MAC protocols supporting duty cycle in a distributed way, send a preamble lasting TS to express their interest for communication. A node listens until the end. When this preamble is over, it transmits an acknowledgement. When this acknowledgement comes, the transmitter knows that, okay, its neighbor is ready, then communication resumes. In this paradigm, the burden of initiating communication is on the transmitter. So if a transmitter has a packet to send, it has to remain awake until it has sent all the packets successfully. Then it can go back to sleep. And the channel is now being utilized by the preambles, acknowledgement, and the useful data packet. So this is what happens. So we have a sender and we have a receiver. These two nodes wish to communicate, but by the time the sender is ready, here you see the receiver is not available, sleeping. But the sender now sends long preamble, lasting, as I said, at least TS duration. By this time, the node now wakes up and then it receives the preamble and it waits until the transmission of the preamble is complete. Then it sends a, an acknowledgement and then data communication takes place here. And during this time, this is the active time and then when this data communication is finished, it can go to sleep. It has completed transmission. This one does not go immediately because other neighbors may wish to communicate with it. So it will, would stay for some time. If other paper uh, nodes wish to communicate still, it has to wait until all communication is exhausted. But if nobody is there, again, after some time, it will go back, it will go to sleep back. So these were the early uh, B mark because it was developed at uh, University of California, Berkeley campus. It was called B mark. The problem with B mark is that it's a long, long preamble. Suppose the node uh, here, the, sorry, the, 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 the receiver wakes up at this point. 
this one has started communication at this point. then it would have been sufficient for the node to know that somebody wishes to communicate, for, for R to know that S wishes to communicate with it. But it has to wait until the whole transmission of the preamble is completed. And then only then the data transmission begins. It was receiving the whole preamble just for nothing so transmitting a monolithic preamble is disadvantageous it has a cost in terms of energy and in terms of latency packet communication would have been completed around this time but it has to be deferred until this time the energy consumption you can imagine all of course from here to here was just for nothing. So to improve this one, the SMAC developed at uh, Rice University divides the preambles into multiple strobes. There are still preambles, as you can see here, there are preambles, but they are divided into multiple strobes. And the, the, the time between two strobes is deliberately made less than a CCA, so that another node may think that no communication is taking place. So it's deliberately made smaller, the time between them, but sufficient enough for a node to switch between receiving and transmitting mode. Otherwise, the preamble is divided. So suppose the receiver wakes up at this point. Two strokes have already been communicated, and then the surge one will be received here. Then the, the, the receiver says, I am awake, stop communicating. It sends this acknowledgement. When this acknowledgement comes, now data communication resumes. So you can curtail the transmission of unnecessary preamble as soon as an acknowledgement arrives from the sleeping or from the waking node. So these two are preamble-based MAC protocols which enable distributed sleeping or the, implement the distributed implementation of a duty cycle. But in both cases, as you can see, the channel is now occupied with control packets, preambles, acknowledgement as well as the useful packet. The next, uh, this is a summary of the uh, XMAC, some of the advantage when it comes to the uh, use of monolithic uh, uh, preamble. You can uh, go uh, through this slide, but I have already summarized. The next uh, MAC protocol which supports the distributed implementation of uh, sleeping schedule is RIMAC developed at Rice University. RI stands for Receiver Initiated MAC Protocol. RI-MAC at, uh, uh, attempts to remove the use of preambles so that the channel utilization can be improved. How does it achieve? Here, the burden of initiating communication is not on the transmitter, but on the receiver. Nodes independently go to sleep. Transmitter wishing to communicate with their neighbors simply wait, they don't do anything. If they have packets to transmit, they don't go to sleep, they wait. What do they wait for? They wait for the arrival of a beacon, a very slim packet, indicating that a receiver is ready to receive packets. How does it do? When nodes wake up from sleep, they will emit a beacon saying, okay, I am awake. The nodes in the surrounding wishing to communicate have been waiting for this packet. When they receive this beacon, they now know, okay, my neighbor is awake. I can't initiate now communicating. 
communication. So CSM, CSMA would take place and then packet transmission can continue. But the CSMA now is not the usual CSMA we know, it's a little different and I'm going to show you how this happens. So S and R wish to communicate with one another. The sender doesn't do anything. It just waits until the arrival of a beacon. R can go to sleep anytime it wishes based on its knowledge of the activity of the, uh, its surrounding. But the duration of its sleep is fixed. It's a global parameter. When it wakes up, it emits this beacon. This beacon will be received. Remember, at this point, S wishes to communicate, but it just waits. And then B now sends this beacon. When this beacon comes, oh, A is free to communicate with me. Now, data transmission would take place. And then after each data transmission, B does not need to send acknowledgement as usual. It just needs to send B. A beacon. This beacon can be regarded as an acknowledgement for S, but for all the others, it can be regarded as ready to receive packets. If no other competition takes place, again, S sends data would receive B until the transmission is complete. Then the node waits for some time to make sure that no neighbors are waiting for it to communicate. If there are no neighbors wishing to communicate, again, it goes back to sleep to save energy. In more detail, what happens when two or more sensor nodes wish to communicate with R at the same time? How does it uh, support distributed uh, medium access control? The RIMAC avoids the use of CSMA in the classical sense, but implements it in a slightly different way. So here it is. S and R communicate with, uh, as a receive B. Okay, R wakes up, sends beacon to all of them. Both think that the medium is free, they send data, and then they collide. It's okay. Here, now collision happens. They don't get acknowledgement. Instead, now in this B beacon, embedded will be a time for random back off. When they detect in this beacon a round of back on, they, they learn about this implicitly by, because the size of the beacon now increases and decreases. If the size of the beacon is the basic size, it can be regarded as acknowledgement or a notification of waking up. If the size of B increases, it is a sign that collision has happened. So they have to look into this beacon to determine how long they should back off randomly. Now the size has increased. S1 and S2 would indirectly know that collision has happened on their packets, so they have to do random back. Here, hopefully, S1 has won, ha, has picked a shorter random back off. Now it can send data. Now, if this data is successfully uh, transmitted, B sends now a beacon. And now the size of the beacon automatically decreases because there is no random back off in it. And then the packet will be successfully transmitted. But however, suppose again another collision happens. If another collision happens, again, the size of the beacon would increase. Now they have to do random back off for the second time. But in this case, no collision has happened. S1 has won, but for the next round, S2 would continue uh, counting down, not from scratch, but from where it has stopped. That means, suppose at this time, 
this one picked up, let's say five, and this one picked up seven. So this would count down to win the medium. For the next round now, it would begin counting from five because up to five, they both have counted. This has exhausted. This was not finished. Now it would begin counting down from five to seven. That means in the next round, S2 would win, win the medium and then communicate when the, the beacon arrives. By just implementing a single beacon, our iMac has now achieved distributed sleeping. It has significantly reduced the use of control packets. So the channel utilization is improved. No preamble at all. And this is how our iMac function. Does it have some, some, some drawbacks? Yes, it does. If, for example, any, let's, join, let's go back here. If S1, instead of wishing to communicate here, if it wishes to communicate at this point, if it wakes up at this point, and just by a slight fraction of a second missed the beacon coming from R. Then it has to wait for the arrival of another beacon. If no other nodes are communicating in the surrounding, this beacon would arrive after R has gone to sleep and woken up. So this is the problem of R IMAC. Another problem with R IMAC. S wishes to communicate here, but the actual communication takes place here. That means it has to, it was idly waiting up to this point. This also costs some energy. So channel utilization is achieved in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an average sense, but if we closely look into the fine grained performance, the transmitter has to wait until a beacon arrives, costing energy. And if the transmitter misses a beacon, which is very slim, remember, that means the transmission lasts only briefly, then it has to wait for the arrival of a beacon after an entire uh, sleeping duration has elapsed. As a summary, today we have seen how a MAC protocol functions to arbitrate the use of a shared uh, medium uh, among multiple contending sensor nodes. We have considered uh, TDMA and CSMA. Uh, CSMA is uh, distributed. Uh, nodes regulate the medium on their own but implicitly the duration of communication is uh, determined uh, because we uh, determine the, the size of a packet, the size of control packet, the duration of CCA, the duration of uh, 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 short interframe space, the duration of random back off and so on. So implicitly fairness is achieved by determining the size of all these uh, primitives. CSMA CA tries to avoid a problem arising from hidden terminals, from terminals uh, or from nodes which may not uh, be able to uh, listen to their environment. Uh, by introducing control uh, packets, it was possible to uh, resolve this problem, but we have seen that it is imp uh, in not entirely uh, possible to avoid exposed uh, terminals when we are dealing with exposed terminals uh, inhibiting sensor nodes to have a complete knowledge of their uh, environment. Uh, we say this is tolerable because the probability of uh, this type of incidents occurring is relatively uh, low. If collision occurs, however, packet retransmission would be um, 
taking will take place. So it's it's okay in the end. The the through the the impact on the throughput, especially in low rate wireless sensor network, is uh, limited. We also uh, saw uh, how uh, MAC protocol for wireless sensor network try to achieve uh, power management by defining duty cycles. Uh, we specifically consider two type of uh, MAC protocols, uh, preamble-based MAC protocols and beacon-based MAC protocols. In preamble-based MAC protocols, transmitters initiate um, communication by sending uh, uh, preambles as an expression of interest and waiting for uh, acknowledgement in receiver uh, initiated MAC protocols, the transmitter rather wait for the arrival of a beacon uh, to uh, communicate. In both cases, distributed sleeping uh, could be uh, achieved. This, by this, we come to the end of today's uh, lecture. Next uh, time, we'll begin with uh, routing protocols for wireless sensor uh, networks. Thank you for listening and goodbye.